Voting isn't just going to the polls anymore on election day. Options like early voting, mail-in voting, and ballot drop boxes are available to more voters and are growing in popularity. How to Vote is a tool created by Democracy Works, and it breaks down the options your state offers by forecasting a ballot, empowering you to decide where and when to vote. Democracy works best when we all vote, but misinformation and confusion about election procedures have resulted in low voter turnout. How to Vote takes the guesswork out of the voting process. It is easy to use and helps folks from all over the country overcome many of the process barriers to voting. It is committed to helping you vote no matter what. You can use the How to Vote tool to sign up for election reminders, see what's on your ballot, get step-by-step assistance requesting your mail ballot, explore your options for returning your mail-in ballot, check your voter registration status, and find your local polling site and make sure that you have an appropriate ID to bring with you. Decide when and where you'll vote this year at howto.vote. Hello and welcome to the formal review. Today, we will be looking at the 2018 film, Black Klansman. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the review. Hey everybody, welcome back to the formal review. This is episode 16. Thanks for tuning in, and as with all my reviews, there may be some spoilers, but I do my best to keep it fairly vague. But I do think that you should see the film first before listening, just so you understand everything that I have to say about it. But if you don't care about those types of things, keep listening. Black Klansman is a biographical drama film directed by Spike Lee and written by Charlie Wachtel, David Rabinowitz, Kevin Wilmot, and Spike Lee himself. It is based on 2014 memoir Black Klansman by Ron Stallworth, who this story is about. Yes, that means this film is a true story. The film stars John David Washington, who is the son of Denzel Washington as Stallworth, alongside Adam Driver, Laura Harrier, and Topher Grace. It is set in 1972 in Colorado Springs. It is based around the first African-American man to infiltrate the KKK while working for the police department. When I first heard about this film, I immediately connected it to the Dave Chappelle skit where a blind black man joins the KKK. Now, this film is nothing like that, so do not go into the film expecting a comedy. Yes, there's comedic aspects to it, but if you go expecting a comedy, you're going to be very disappointed. This film is a straight up drama. It is a very powerful film. It was released on August 10th that coincides with the one year anniversary of the Charlottesville rally done by white supremacists. So at the beginning of the film, Ron Stallworth is originally assigned to work in the records room and this is a, the story takes place only eight years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was put in. And so Stallworth as being the first black detective in this police department, he's receiving a lot of racial biases toward him in that he's looked down as a lesser police officer just because he's black. Initially they put him in records and people call him names and they go without being punished. He requests to go from record to be transferred to undercover. Then he gets assigned when Kwame Tura, also known as Stokely Carmichael, comes to visit the local university. For those who don't know who Stokely Carmichael is, this guy is the guy who developed the whole idea of the black power movement. This is just a small background of who this guy is because a lot of the people that I've talked to about he's overshadowed by Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I mean he worked initially under Martin Luther King but he got to his breaking point when it came to the non-violence that Martin Luther King was promoting. And he eventually realized that nonviolence is more of a tactic and it wasn't a principle to work with. And Carmichael essentially criticized the civil rights leaders who wanted integration of these African Americans into the existing middle class mainstream. Then he joined the Black Panther Party in 1968, where he obviously became a very prominent person in that, but he was only with them for about a year because he was a very anti-white activist in that Black Panthers tried to keep white activists in the movement about black power and that they could help the movement, but Carmichael was along the lines of Malcolm X and said that white activists should organize their own communities first. Around then, he also changed his name from Stokely Carmichael 
Carmichael to Kwame Ture, essentially pulling out his own movement at this point. He visited a lot of colleges, talking and giving speeches. So the local university at Colorado Springs brings him to give a speech about black power. But because he did have, at times, some FBI involved people, the police of Colorado Springs were taken aback by how powerful his speeches were. That's why they sent Stallworth to go undercover and listen to his story. At this rally, he meets Patrice Dumas, played by Harrier, and she's the president of the Black Student Union, and they get to listen to his speak. And this is actually a really powerful scene. And the reason why I really like this scene, Corey Hawkins, Dr. Dre and Straight Outta Compton. He also was in the TV show 24 Legacy. He was also in Kong Skull Island. Hawkins does a really good job in embodying who Kwame Ture was. He was an excellent speaker, very powerful, but he was also fairly radical in the sense of stating that there is going to be a war between African Americans and whites and that they should rise up against them. He was definitely about militarizing his side of because he believed that one side's gonna shoot guns at us, we need to be able to defend ourselves. This scene particularly in the context of the entire movie is extremely powerful because of the fact that it shows the duality of the two extreme groups. While the KKK when Stallworth is infiltrating them, and how he infiltrates them is he sees a note in the local newspaper for it, and calls and pretends to be a white man. They really like him. So Adam Driver's character has to play him in person. So anyway, going back to the point of the contrast of both extremes. While one is looked at as a huge negative, the other is not the best way either. And it's compared Comparing these two extremes in how the idea of Gandhi, an eye for an eye, makes the whole world blind. And showing these two aspects from a radical point of view, they're fairly similar. Obviously their beliefs are very different and one is fighting for just equal quality, the other one's fighting to kill off everyone who doesn't look like them. There's a big difference at a fundamental level of these two groups, but from a group perspective and how they're both fairly radical, this film is able to show this contrast of these two points of view. And I think that's one thing that Spike Lee does a lot in his film, is showing this kind of duality. Whether it's a duality of a character or a duality of an action, Malcolm X did it in showing how the character changed. Do the right thing, I mean the entire movie is about that. Did Mookie do the right thing at the end of the film? And uh, Inside Man showing the difference between the robber and the police officer. So Spike Lee has been been doing this for a while and I think that's why he's one of my favorite directors. While obviously the KKK is in this film, again, is used in a way to show that they're for the most part a bunch of bumbling idiots. From a fundamental standpoint, they are just guys who meet together, have a couple beers, while discussing extreme hate. I think the script is very strong because it mixes humor and drama very well, but it also ties in and parallels this 1972 story to today. And it's not done in a typically overpowering way. For example, there are a few characters in this film that say lines that are that have been used or connect directly to today's political environment. And while these characters may not have said these lines specifically in real life, you don't have to suspend your disbelief at all to see them saying And this film, I think, ends on a very powerful level. The film moves fairly well. I I didn't feel bored pretty much at any point in the film. As I was talking about with Hawkins, I think the acting in this is very, very good. John David Washington is a real chip off the old block. And because there are moments in this film where I legitimately thought it was a young Denzel Washington. Yeah, he looks different, but there was so many emphasisms on the right word. You could tell that this guy is his son. And I mean, that's not to say it in a bad way to say he needs to find his own own voice, but he does a really good job at playing this conflicted character. And this is another part of Spike Lee's duality. As a cop, John Stallworth is looked at from the Black Power movement as a pig a problematic person. He's part of the system that's going to shoot them in the back. And obviously he's not. He's obviously all for what the Black Power movement is pushing. However, he has a job to do as a cop. So this conflict is of what a black man potentially 
would go through as a police officer. You see this conflict going inside his head is that he wants to be there for his people with the Black Power Movement, but he thinks that the best way to get the job done is from within the system. They look at him as an Uncle Tom and not as somebody who's trying to help their cause. And I think another thing that Spike Lee does very well in the film is contrasting something that happened in 1972 to the events of today and how unfortunately not much has changed. Adam Driver as Flip Zimmerman, he has a lot of character because he is a mix of multiple people who in the real life the characters weren't Jewish and I think that that definitely also adds another duality in showing that Jewish people are looked down upon by the KKK and, and I think that showing this character who is Jewish and has to go and actually infiltrate and say all these hate things versus Jews, blacks, it shows a of real inner divide that he has to go through. And these are people that look like him. I saw the parallels between him going into the KKK and infiltrating that act and talking to these people, similarly to when Stallworth was going in and talking to the Black Power movement. Zimmerman is not a religious man, but from a cultural standpoint, he does recognize the fact that he is Jewish. So when he hears all this hate crime, he starts to understand where Stallworth is coming from and how bad it is for him and I think that's a very good analogy the Jewish people and African Americans were both killed just for a difference and I think that that's a good comment on the fact that when it comes to these hate groups you can't fight it alone you really need to work with other people showing them working together in such a positive way really emphasizes the idea of brotherhood in peace and I think that that's a definitely a very strong idea of Martin Luther King and another person who I thought was cast very well his is Topher Grace as David Duke. For those who know Topher Grace, he's known as Eric Foreman from that 70s show. Now, I will admit it did take me a little bit to get accustomed to him not as Eric Foreman, who's dressed up as David Duke, but actually as Topher Grace as an actor. And I think he does a really good job here. And honestly, if you look at the pictures between David Duke at the time and Topher Grace in this film, they look pretty identical. And he does a really good job as this guy who was the Grand Wizard or National Director director of the KKK. And there's one scene that involves Harry Belafonte that I think is one of the most powerful scenes in a film that I've ever seen. And again, this goes into showing the comparison between the two extremist groups, but obviously how one is fighting for rights for people who have been killed. The scene with him, I think, is fantastic. And the story that he tells is 100% real. The one thing that I could say about this film that's a little bit of a flaw is I do feel that the girlfriend's story that connected Stallworth to the Black Power movement, I didn't feel that their relationship was real. I don't think she was in it that much, and her story obviously was sideline story in comparison to the overall plot, but it didn't feel very connected. It seemed to be there only for that connecting the two storyline. I don't think the relationship was built up very well. I mean, it's a relationship that was wasn't real. I did really like Harrier as her when she came on screen, but I do feel that plot point was a little weaker. That's really the only flaw I could find with this film because I thought this film was great. I think it's a very important film and also one of Spike Lee's best. While it may not be the best film on his resume, I would say it's definitely in the top three films. I think that it's definitely worth checking out in theaters if it comes to your town. Definitely make moves and go see this film. I think that best adapted screenplay, definitely in the possibility. I would definitely put this in my top films for the year. At the end of the day, I would rate this film a 4.5 out of 5 bow ties. Now, I want to know what you guys thought of the film, and what is your favorite Spike Lee film? Now, I want to again thank you for listening in. It's a lot of fun to just talk about movies so you never miss an episode of any of the reviews please subscribe on your favorite platform that you listen to podcasts i'm on google Podcasts, itunes stitcher spotify let me know what you guys think if, if there's something you want me to improve on let me know i'm always willing to grow and also if there's a movie that you want me to review on an episode hit me up on social media to talk about it the url is all the same it's at the formal review and you can also check out box office buzz for up-to-date movie news and I also do some retrospective reviews on there. As with all my reviews, I have music in the background. This is not my music. This is 
usually music that supports the film as a whole, and usually it will be the score. I think that it adds elements of the film that normally isn't appreciated as much, and so today's background music was done by Terrence Blanchard on the Black Klansman original soundtrack. Until next time, see you at the movies. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Formal Review. We hope you'll join us again.